Hello and welcome to another edition of the Detroit Lions Breakdown Podcast. My name is Eric Schlitt and uh, with me this uh, episode is a special guest. Joe gets the uh, episode off. He's uh it's, it's my fault, really. I mean, like, I, I, my schedule doesn't work very well with everybody, and so I've made it difficult for Joe to attend with us. Uh, so uh, Joe's getting the, the week off, uh, but fortunately, my schedule has matched up with uh, my good buddy, friend of the podcast, friend of mine, friend of everyone's, really, I would have to say, <laughs> Jeremy Reisman uh, of uh, Pride of Detroit. This Obviously, we are co-workers. Uh, Jeremy gets the the fun editor in chief role. Uh, you know that's uh, how you doing, buddy? I'm, I'm good. I I never have anything going on, so you know my schedule's really <laughs> mesh with everybody's. <laughs> well, I appreciate it. Um, I was going to do this one solo because uh, uh, you know we've we've it's it's been almost a week now, geez, since uh, the Lions started their 53 man roster uh, cut down and. You know, while I wanted to wait until all of the secondary moves were completed before we uh, did our podcast here, um, it just then it became a problem with the schedules. And I just, you know, I'm, my life is just upside down crazy right now. So I was going to do it solo, uh, but solo sometimes boring, even though everyone knows I could talk for an hour by myself. <laughs> and, uh, um, but I figured it's better with banter. And so uh, I'll, I'll we, spice uh, things up here. Y- yeah, right. So. Uh, usually we open the podcast talking about, um, you know, new additions and all that stuff, but look, since it's, we're talking, everything's a new edition, you know, everything is a breakdown of the, of the roster. So I think we just jump into it and just start talking about like, um, what are our impressions? Are we happy with, uh, you know, the numbers that they kept, the players that they kept, uh, were you surprised by any of them? I mean, we'll just, we'll give our impressions on, on what we think and we'll try and keep it fresh. Because I know everyone has probably listened to your podcast breakdown, and I'm sure they've gotten a lot of other breakdown uh, looks from other podcasts because we know Lions fans are very avid podcast listeners, right? Okay. So, uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll, keep it, we'll keep it fresh. All right, so start with quarterbacks. No surprise, Jared Goff, right? He's, uh, he's uh, going to be the starter, and then uh, Tim Boyle is the backup. Uh, Tim Boyle, we find out later, has broken his hand. Thumb, right? Thumb. Thumb. Yeah, broke his thumb, and he's uh, shifted to IR since making the 53-man roster, and so he makes the initial 53, then he goes, he has to be on the roster for 24 hours, and he goes on IR, now he's eligible to return, and uh, six to eight weeks means he's going to miss at least the first month of the season, that leaves David Blau as uh, the number three, and then they added um Steven Montez to the practice squad as kind of like an emergency guy who they'll be working on trying to um, get up to speed on the playbook in case something happens to one of the other two. Right. So uh, no real surprises there. Right. Yeah. No, no surprises. I mean, the injury kind of made their decision a lot easier Yeah. Um, because I, I think there, there was a legitimate question at the end of camp, who was the true number two. Sure. Obviously Tim Boyle did not look pretty good in, in the, the penultimate preseason game but he had a, had a decent finale there especially considering he he had that touchdown drive with the uh, with the broken thumb but um yeah. the injury makes it very clear David Blau's your number two Tim Boyle I guess when he comes back maybe that conversation strikes up again but that won't be for at least uh it sounds like two months yeah yeah um he'll get a couple of weeks here at the end of uh the off season, so that'll eat up some of the recovery time but yeah it's at least a month of the season is is going to be gone for him um I don't know. I mean, like he played well enough on that broken thumb. Yeah. Maybe I wonder if they speculated not re, not repairing it and just uh, let. No, I'm just kidding. I know how <laughs> I know how that sucks. Like, <laughs> hey, I get my cast off uh, in four days, and so I am uh, I am ready. I am uh, five weeks and three days into this thing, and I am done. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. So yeah. So get his hand right. And then, you know, look, even if they, even if he's healed, cause like a broken finger in your hand, I mean, look, throw again. I, I've, yeah, I, I'm right. That takes six weeks to heal. I I'm, I am case in point. <laughs> I'm showing my cast on the screen right now. We, so it's gonna, it's six weeks minimum. 
then it's going to be that recovery time. That's why right. I think you aren't off the, off the ball here when you said at least two months, probably because it's going to take him time. Like for me, um, like these are little things you don't think about. Like I'm going to have a month of physical therapy just right. to try and get my hand grip back. So he's going to have to go through that as well. He's going to have six weeks in the cast. Then he's going to have to have hand th uh, therapy. And then he's probably going to have to have at least another um, couple of weeks of just acclimating. So it's like, right. it's, it's really possible. He misses like half the season uh, yeah. at, at this point, especially like you said, throwing hand. So, um, so Blau gets the nod. Um, I, I mean, are you familiar with Montez? I know a little bit of him from Colorado. He interested me in the draft. Uh, mobile quarterback had uh, had a lot of statistics uh, at Colorado, but um, he never really progressed. He kind yeah. of was what he was, right? Right. Like he, he the same quarterback he was as a sophomore, he was as a senior, and he was as, as a in the NFL with uh, Washington. So um, he's never really developed. So you kind of know what his ceiling is, but he's an interesting uh, character. He, I mean, he's a perfect guy to have on your scout team, right? Yeah, because he's mobile. Because he's mobile. So, I mean, week one, we're probably going to see at least a little bit of Trey Lance. Yeah. I, I, I feel like by the time we see the Bears, they're probably going to, you know, move into their uh, uh, rookie quarterback. So, I, I just, yeah, I, I think you've got a guy with a lot of physical traits that are really, really good. And that's that's a guy you probably want on your scout team. Yeah, I I, I, I think that's a smart um, a smart way of looking at it. Yeah. Anything else on the quarterbacks? I think that's – it kind of was what it was. Uh, yeah. Again, running back, uh, no surprises at the top. Swift is kept. Uh, Jamal Williams is kept. Those are good. That's going to be your one-two punch. I have been touting Justin Jefferson as RB3. I know you've been a little bit skeptical of that, but I, I he just looks sharp to me. Uh, I still think he's going to go in as RB3. Yeah. And with Swift's injury history and uh, his pension for – even the slightest little ding up, knocking him out uh, of some playing time. I, I think Jefferson's going to get some, some runs here and I'm, I'm excited to see him play very decisive runner. Uh, he understands the cut, uh, how to, how to cut, how to make the cuts. He sees the visions. He's, he's got good ability to his cutback is really elite. That's one of his yep. best things. Um, pass pro is getting better. So I, I still think he's in a really uh, good spot there. And then uh, Godwin Igwebuke. I didn't know. I probably messed that up, didn't I? Right? Igwebuke. I can't get that there. I mean, that's I, I look terrible. He'll turn. Um, he'd turn his head if you said that to him. <laughs> so Godwin, uh, <laughs> he he won the four job, the RB four job, basically in camp, and I and, yeah. and we we've talked about this uh, previously. Uh, special teams comes into play with him. He's a kick returner might even be their starting kick returner he's been in that starting kick returner role since practice 10 and maybe even before that uh he's got uh he's got good speed look he's on paper he is the fastest running back they have because yeah. he, he has he has sub four 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 i think is what is just under that right and i think swiss was four four eight so uh godwin is he's he's quick right and you know we saw you know, he was able to, what he was able to do in the preseason, he was able to make some hay. And while his overall stats weren't good, he still found the end zone twice. Um, and he's an upside guy, right? Yeah. Uh, so uh, those four, you, you comfortable with those four surprise they kept for? Um, no, not at all. I, I think, I think you, you nailed it. Like while there were, there were times in which it felt like Jamar Jefferson just kind of disappeared. There was never any sign that his role as RB3 was really in jeopardy. He was always repping high, um, both in the preseason and in camp. And, and yeah, I, I think he's a good fit in the scheme with Iguabuque. I mean, you just, it's, and this is going to become a common theme. I think uh, of, of the conversations we're going to have is he just earned it. There, there's a lot yeah. of guys out here that, that didn't, didn't earn it. And there are a lot of guys out here that we counted out and they ended up earning it in camp. And Iguabuque is a guy who from beginning to end really showed a lot of massive improvement. And to me, uh, you mentioned his speed, but that touchdown that he scored in the final game where he was in, it was a fourth and goal. He stopped yeah. originally and, and just kind of pushed oh, his way through yeah. I, I, that, that surprised me. And that showed me that maybe he has a little bit more in the tank than just speed. So um, I'm, I'm totally, I think it's actually a pretty decent running back unit um, mm -hmm. considering where it's been in the past. The depth has always kind of been an issue. Um, yeah. Even RB two has been an issue. And I think, uh, I think from top to bottom, this might be the best running back group we've seen in a few years. Yeah. I, he's a you know as a former safety one of the things he was known for was he was a hitter 
physicality. And yeah, and so like it, it's not overly surprising to me anyway. Uh, it was nice to see him use some of the, some of that translated, right? Yeah. Uh, and then of course the fan favorite Craig Reynolds makes the practice squad. Uh, De- yeah, Dedrick Mills makes it initially, and then he gets removed for somebody else. And so it's uh, it's Craig Reynolds on the uh, is RB five, I guess you know on the practice squad. With the way RBs get injured, you know, you never know. Um, he could get a call up. He could be, you know, with the whole practice squad elevation this year, you never know if he, he, he could get a shot. Um, but having carrying four and probably only leaning on three on a weekly basis, he would need like two of those guys to get injured, yeah. in my opinion, in yeah. order to really get some make hay. So, um, I mean, look, that is unless – uh, unless like Godwin or Jefferson don't live up to par, like if, they, if they're not sure. playing, if they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing, it's possible Craig gets a shot that way as well. So um, I know everybody's enamored with him. Uh, I, to me, he still looks like a developmental guy, um, but uh, look, he's got great vision and that goes a long way. That's one of the number one traits you look for in a running back. Yep. Another, and another guy who earned it. I mean, he earned it more than Diedrich Mills did. Diedrich, Diedrich was, wasn't bad himself either. And yeah, I think no, that's I like why him. he made the, the original practice yeah. squad. And maybe they'll just, you know, keep his name on a short list if they get into injury trouble. But um, mm-hmm. Craig Reynolds is a guy who showed up and immediately made an impact. And that's making the 50 and making the, the 16 man practice squad is, is no small feat for him, I, I would say. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, all right. Let's shift to receiver where there was a little bit more uh play than the first two spots there tyro williams makes it as we kind of expected uh, wide receiver one uh, obviously i'm on rossi brown makes it as as your slot uh receiver two essentially we've been talking up khalif raymond um for geez weeks now right and so um raymond is probably going to be like a, the starter on the outside but i i i'm still of the mindset that that spot is going to be kind of a rotation of guys. Mm-hmm. And I would not be surprised to see if Quintus Cephas, who also made the roster, uh, is in a rotation with Raymond in that spot. Yeah. Makes a ton of sense to just use use a rotation on the outside and, and just keep those guys fresh. Uh, a Raymond Cephas combination uh, is, is actually decent considering the lack of talent in the receiver room. Uh, that's not a terrible spot. Now, after that, uh, it gets a little bit surprising, right? Yeah. Uh, Tom Kennedy makes the roster. Now that shouldn't be overly surprising because he had a great camp is one of those guys, like you said, that earned it. Um, but he's redundant, right? Um, he's redundant to uh, St. Brown. He's re- uh, Raymond can do, can do a lot what he does. And, and then we'll talk about the other guy who can do a lot what he does as well in just a second. But um, are you surprised Kennedy's uh, made the roster or one or two is still around? Uh, I mean, a little bit of both. I, I had him on my final 53, but that was only yes, because did. it really sounded like the coaches had made that decision. You know, we, uh, obviously the guy who we felt like he was most in contention for that spot was Brashad Perriman, and he yeah. certainly did not earn the spot. So it, it's just a matter of like, are we trying to build a, a complete roster here with a bunch of different roles filled or are we rewarding the guys who mm-hmm. earned it? And they chose the latter because you're right. Like Tom Ken, I don't really see a way Tom Kennedy fits into this team's offensive plans right away. Maybe he's just stepped there in case someone gets injured. Maybe they're just going to throw him out there because it it does seem like they're throwing a lot of young players out there this year and just kind of seeing what sticks. Yeah. And and he produces, right? Right. Like he's one of the guys that's pretty consistently getting open. Uh, He's never really shown that in a regular season. He was active a couple of games a couple years ago maybe even one game a couple years ago um but he's never really been able to show that uh, in the regular season now maybe that has to do with the last coaching staff but uh, he might actually he might get an opportunity here to prove that he can earn more snaps now there's two more receivers that got added after the fact or well one after the fact one on the on the day of cutdowns um, and maybe they're waiting for those two to get acclimated and up to speed before they yeah. want to move on Kennedy. Yeah. The thing is, is Ken, I, I don't know what Kennedy does on special teams right now. And if he doesn't have a role on special teams, then uh, he's going to be, he could be the inactive. first guy off the roster. Yeah. He's gonna, probably going to be inactive. And then he right. could be the first guy off the roster when they need somebody else. So um, uh, if you're a Tom Kennedy fan, you're hoping he earns some sort of special teams role because the two guys that they traded for, 
do play special teams. Or right. The two guys they acquired do play special teams. One of them they traded for is Trinity Benson. Uh, Benson is the guy that uh, when Brad Holmes and his staff were looking at the potential wide receivers that they believe were going to get cut and put on the waiver wire, he was the guy who was at the top of the list. And they said consistently week after week during the preseason, he stayed at the top of the list and he went from an unknown to uh, their top option, their clear top option. And with the way the receiver room is, they thought that it would be beneficial to go get him because there's a good chance somebody else could have put a waiver claim in ahead of them. And then all of a sudden now you don't get your guy. So you want to go get your guy. That's fine. You drop a couple of uh, draft picks, uh, late round draft picks. I don't care. Um, look, you, you lose a, a fifth rounder that, you know, but you're getting a sixth back a year later. That's close. The seventh, I don't care. You can throw sevens in all day. Like, honestly, <laughs> it's just the way it is. I mean, it is, it's, it's sure. sad. Um, but like we get so caught up on like what a seventh rounder can be, or you're getting a guy that's going to produce now and you're giving up some capital in order to get a guy that produces now. Now, would it be better if to hold on to a fifth rounder next year? And then maybe that fifth rounder can produce and do something. Look, that's fine. I get it. You got a guy that you think can produce now. You got to give something up in order to go get them. So that's was their choice. We'll see if it pays off. We, we don't know. We don't, we, we really, we don't know. We haven't even seen this guy yet. Right. Right. So um, we don't Barely know if anybody has, he's a, yeah, he's a right? D2 guy and he's only played in the preseason essentially. So um and yeah. yeah, I mean, I think it's an, it's an interesting play here because y- you mentioned like you're getting someone who can contribute now, but he's also what, 24, 20, you know, 23, mm-hmm. 24. He's very, really young. I mean, he's a developmental prospect kind of guy signed for two and more a, years. Yeah. And, and if you're, you're really shallow in your wide receiver department, maybe he gets a shot to, to prove something where he wouldn't have in Denver. You absolutely need a field stretcher in this scheme. Yep. And you lost that guy when Perryman couldn't cut it. And so what did they do? They went and they found a guy who can stretch the field. And so maybe he becomes part of that three-man rotation. You know what I mean? And he, and even if it's situational work right off the bat, you need a field stretcher. We've talked about it. They had to get, they identified the guy they wanted. They went and they got him. We'll see if it pays off, right? You you have, it's going to cost money to get what you want sometimes and, 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 or capital, I guess. All right. So, uh, we'll see what Benson does. Uh, they seem very optimistic about him. I know people, are, a lot of people have been asking if we expect him to start. Uh, we don't, like you said, D2 guy who hasn't made it out of the preseason, but has a specific skill set that they're looking for. That's a contributor right now. Uh, but he'll get a chance just like anyone else to, to jump up and, and uh, see if they can beat out Cephas or Raymond. Uh, and then the last guy they uh, claimed off of waivers, and that's Kadero Hodge. Uh, Hodge is primarily a special teamer and he has uh, some good uh, wide receiver experience as well, but he's the special teams is really where he makes his hay. He got to start with the Rams where Brad Holmes was uh, one of the guys who helped, I guess, identify him. And then when they, the Rams cut him, it was John Dorsey who picked him up off waivers. So right. there's a couple of front office guys that really like him. And so that's why uh, he ends up on this roster. Uh, again, I think he's active over a guy like Tom Kennedy because he has a special teams role. Right. And um, I know you wrote um, that you expect he might even be more active than Hodge uh, or than Benson right Benson. off the bat. Yeah. yeah. Because again, he's, he's a, he's a ve- more veteran guy who's able to contribute. And so I get that. Um, he took a pay cut to come to, to, uh, to stick around. Like, he was uh, the he came from the Browns, right? Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The Browns tendered him at a second round RFA tender, which is like unusual for a guy, especially with that receiver room. And so um, they, that's, that was a $2.13 million to keep him. And that, that's a lot of money for, for a special teamer. It's more than uh, Reeves Maven makes. That's more than like, you know, the other special team specialists make. So, but, but again, if you're, if you're, a little bit trepidatious about him the browns were willing to pay that kind of money to go to just to keep him on the roster for the offseason it kind of speaks to you know where he can contribute i guess um okay so uh he, again another guy that we're not gonna know about right now because we just we haven't seen him right and we won't either right unfortunately because exactly. because now practice is back down to the the 15 minute period where we only essentially see warmups. So he's going to yep. be one of those guys like Logan Stenberg last year, where we're just like, 
well, we'll see if he ever gets on the field. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, I don't know how the Gunners are going to shake out since they moved on from Mike Ford. Spoiler. Uh, (laughs) um, But, uh, you know, I I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be a defensive back, a couple of defensive backs that end up in those gunner roles, but you know, you never know if uh, Hodge may, he, he's probably going to kick in somewhere else. And I, I think he'll be active, probably active in week one. All right. Anything else you want to add? Now let's, let's move to the two tight ends on the roster. All right. <laughs> Hawkinson and Fells, no surprise, right? Fells had to do a little loop-de-loop on the uh, roster just from a management standpoint, but yeah, he's back. He's, he's doing what he's doing. Uh, and those are your two guys. Uh, your tight end three is a guy that I skipped over in the running backs group for some reason is essentially Jason Cabinda. Sure. Um, Cabinda is your fullback slash H back slash probably tight end three. And in all honesty, Matt Nelson might be your tight end three when they want to go into big sets. Yeah. Just, just saying. Yeah. Um, so they can live without a, a tight end three by using a couple of other guys in order to, uh, to make it work. Uh, but they have three guys on the practice squad. I don't think we need to spend time on Fels or, or Hawkinson, but, but Brock Wright makes the practice squad. Um, uh, Alizé Mack initially does then, then falls off. Then they add Jared Pinckney and Shane Zylstra. Is that right? Zylstra? Zylstra? I don't know. Zylstra, right? I would okay. guess Zylstra. But I am. Uh, yeah. Uh, you're better at names than I am. And so, um, these are two guys. Pinkney's more of a blocker. Uh, Zilstra is more of a receiver. In fact, he was a receiver in college. He was a record setter at Minnesota State. Off the top of my head, I might be right. I might be wrong about that. Uh, something like that. I know he played in, in no, yeah, in Minnesota. He, he went to right. a small college in the state of Minnesota. So um, he was a record setting uh, wide receiver. He caught on. Uh, he was a uh, UDFA in 2020 and then didn't really make a team because that's what happens in 2020. A lot of those UDF guys got looked over, right? Um, and he is a guy who ended up catching on with the Vikings. They converted him to tight end. And so now uh, he's on a tight end on the practice squad. He essentially is what Mac was, right? I think yeah. they tried with Mac and they tried and they tried and they tried and they said, he's just not going to get it as a blocker or a special teamer. And so we're going to have to move on from him. Let's go get another pass catching tight end and see if we can develop his skill set. Yeah. And uh, see if we can turn him into something because Brock Wright isn't doing enough as a pass catcher. Uh, Zilstra is, is, you know, learning to block. And then Pinkney is more balanced, but he's not as, you know, showy. Like Pinkney was a guy who looked like a day two prospect if he came out in the 2019 draft. And then he went back for 2020 Vandy shifted their offense. Uh, his, his uh, stats cut in half. Then he has a terrible pro day. Uh, then he goes undrafted and then he goes to the, you know, he actually gets picked up by a team. Uh, but again, he doesn't, it, there's, he just doesn't catch on because he's just, he, he lacks some athleticism. Um, and so he's another, maybe he develops into something type of guy. So you worried about tight end, uh, not having a tight end three? I mean, it's it's not a great situation. It feels like the three guys that they have on that practice squad are are going to stay there pretty much the entire season. Mm-hmm. Um, but but uh, you know, having a guy like Jason Cabinda, who they clearly really really like in in multiple different roles, they're trying to get him to basically play every position. It feels like on offense. Yeah. Um. So we'll see him. I think in a lot of positions like that. So. Uh, I mean, it, it's not a great situation. If either Hawkinson or Fells goes down, they lose a significant chunk and cannot, they don't have anyone that can, they can really make up either of those spots. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, if, if, if they can stay healthy, they'll be all right. Yeah. I, you know, I think we were wondering when Josh Hill retired, if Fells was his replacement and it kind of looks like Cabinda was his replacement yeah. In, yeah. A lot, in, in a weird way. Um, so, all right. Tight end. Uh, again, not overly surprising. I think pretty much everybody was only picking two tight ends to stick anyways. Yeah. Um, yeah. Injury concerns are, are, are going to be concerned, you know, uh, in the back of our mind always, I think with the tight end group, uh, offensive line. So Decker Jackson, Ragnall, Vitae, Sewell, no surprises. That's your starting five has been, will be Matt Nelson is your OT three, uh, because Tyrell Crosby was cut with an injury designation 
He passes through waivers, is unclaimed, reverts back to the Lions, and uh, is now currently on IR. I checked to make sure. I did too. Because, <laughs> uh, because um, it sure sounds like they were not impressed with him in the, in, in the snaps that he did play in the offseason. You got to remember, he was, he was a trade rumor. Yep. Then he skipped spring camp. Like he yep. was one of only, I think I, there was a couple of guys who had like a kid and then Crosby just skipped and he was just not there because he was mad about something. I don't know. Right. I mean, I'm mad about losing his job, mad about whatever trade rumors. I don't know. He was right. not there. Didn't and want to be there. That's fine. Uh, but that put him behind the eight ball in development. Then he comes to camp and he's trying to get work back in up and then he gets injured. Yeah. And now he gets injured and he comes back and he has a poor performance because he's just coming back off injury. And so Dan Campbell said, yeah, he wasn't good enough. And it's hard to fault Dan Campbell for saying that because the situation that Crosby kind of put himself in didn't do himself any favors. Injury doesn't help, of course, but I still think Crosby is a good enough player that he deserved a shot. Right. Uh, But they pretty much took that out of the equation by putting him, cutting him ahead of time he reverts back to IR, but because he didn't make the initial 53, he cannot come back this season. He is done. Yep. And um, they, the only way he's going to play in the NFL this season is if the Lions release him with an injury settlement. Now, the Lion, it would benefit the Lions because they don't have to pay a salary. Uh, it would benefit him because then he gets to go and catch on potentially with another team and doesn't just sit the season out. So I think both of us agree he's probably headed towards an injury settlement sometime in the future where uh, he can, and then he won't be a, a lion anymore. Yeah, that's that's really what it seems like will happen. And and I think more the, the most telling part is just Dan Campbell straight up saying like he wasn't good enough. Yes. He, I mean, he, we, we don't hear him say things like that very often. He's a very honest, forthcoming guy, but he's also been very protective of his players. Yes. Like even, you know, when they when they released Don Muehlbach, he never said like Don Muehlbach's not good. He just said it was time. You know, yeah. he, he was very protective over his words. Wasn't so much with Tyrell Crosby. And that's to me is very telling and tells me this guy isn't long for the roster, even on IR. Yeah. It's um, it's a, it's a strange situation because the, I don't know. It, 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 there, we, we, we've said this before. It's there's something going on here that we probably didn't know about. Um, I really yeah. think coaches were mad that he skipped the spring. Um, I don't know if, if they had already had a Rocky, uh, you know, relationship that probably didn't help, uh, injury right. made everything worse. If he doesn't get injured, he probably makes his team. Cause I thought he was having a decent camp, uh, but he gets injured and then, uh, that's all she wrote. And so unfortunately, uh, the nicest guy in the roster is, uh, probably not going to be on the roster much longer. Right. All right. So, uh, wrapping up the, in the, uh, rest of the offensive line, uh, Stenberg makes the team over Tommy Kramer, who makes the practice squad. Evan Brown is the, uh, makes the team as a backup center and slash guard combo. And then, uh, Darren Paulo makes the roster on the practice squad as tackle four, essentially. Um, I'm surprised Paulo is still sticking around. Um, <laughs> Now Crosby situation being what it was, and then Skipper was a guy Skipper, I think they had yeah. pegged uh, for a, a role, and then he gets injured in the in the finale, and uh, it sure looks like his season's done. I have no idea why he is not on injured reserve because he was also released with an injury settlement, and he I thought would have reverted back to the Lions roster, but he did not. I'm sorry, he was released with an injury designation, right? Not yeah. And well, then didn't revert back to the Lions roster. And I'm not I, sure why. I think he did. <laughs> I think the Lions just haven't updated their roster because on the transaction wire, he did. Mm-hmm. Okay. But, Cause I checked OMG too. And yeah. uh, that's okay. For those of you who don't know, that's our like uh, re, it's a reporter. Um, like database. NFL gives us a, a yeah, it's yeah. a access database to stats and, and rosters and whatnot. He's so like Crosby is not on the Lions website, but he is on OMG. Right. Um, skipper's not on either so but he was on the transaction wire so yeah i'm not clear i think we need to probably reach out to uh our guy yeah and and figure out some clarification on that some guys have slipped through the crack in the in the past so i I feel like it it, there's a pretty good chance that he's on 
their injured reserve list okay. right now. And it would make sense too, because yeah. he played pretty well. Like he was maybe in line to be OT three. Yeah. Had he but not he, suffered that injury, but he was released again, ahead of cutdowns. So if he is on IR, he can't come back from it. Right. Um, unless he gets an injury, does a uh, injury settlement, then he can, he gets to exit. And then he, if he wanted to return to the lions, he would have to wait out the injury settlement, however many weeks that is. And then he would have to wait out another waiting period to, because you can't return back to your team for another waiting period after that as well. It's right. like, I think it's three weeks we've talked about, right. We yeah, think yeah. it is. Um, so like, let's say he was expected to play three games He's got to be paid for those three games. Then he's got to sit out another three weeks where he's not getting paid. And then he could re-sign with the Lions or he could go sign with anybody at any time once he gets that injury settlement. So, um, yeah, it gets tricky bringing him back, uh, but he seems more likely to come back than Crosby does. Right. Um, but but that, I, his injury also seemed a lot more severe. Like yeah. that, was, that was a very serious like inju- injury, so I yeah. wouldn't be surprised for him to just sit the year out. Yeah. Um, and so that leaves us with Paula. Um, that leaves us with Matt Nelson and Paulo as the backups. And uh, I know a lot of people are very high on Matt Nelson. I am not one of them. Um, I think he has some talent I, and I don't, but I don't think I would feel comfortable <laughs> if he was starting. Um, it would, it would be a big problem in, in, in my mind. I just don't think he's ready. Yeah. And, and again, uh, he's talented, he's athletic. Uh, I just don't think he's ready. And so that concerns me a little bit. You know, I think you can use him as like a OL6 when you're going into big sets, like I talked about with the tight ends there. Um, but man, it, 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 it's a potential problem. I'm a huge advocate for OT3. And so I was, uh, I was hoping that uh, that would have been Crosby's role. But it, it, you know, what is what it is, right? It's, it's Matt Nelson's role right now. Let's see if Matt Nelson can prove me wrong. He, I mean, he flashed a little bit last year, sure. uh, but sure, it sure. does feel like, this training camp and preseason, whatever hap- whatever promise there was last year seemed to have fallen back. And well, it was <laughs> maybe it was, it's just a bigger sample size. <laughs> well, I, he also had a, a tight end on his hip uh, last year yeah, and he true. didn't have, he doesn't have that this true. year. He's more on his own. Um, so Stenberg, I think we both agree was ascending during camp. No surprise yeah. that he made it. Paulo, you know, we'll see what happens. Uh, maybe Paulo will surprise me. Paulo was a guy that they, that Campbell specifically pointed to as saying a guy he wanted to see in preseason three, game three, right? So he specifically pointed him out as a guy he wanted to see. And so he must have been pressed enough right. to, to keep that spot. Uh, I don't know how secure it is. And uh, I am a bit surprised they didn't add to the offensive line other than what they had in-house so it's just it's tricky though right that that position is just hard yeah. to find bodies hard to find guys because everyone is worried about their offensive line and depth most yeah. teams don't have a starting five that's worthy yeah, yeah. of five starters and so finding that reserve guy that can be ot3 or you mm-hmm. know guard three or, or center two um not not easy to find on the way for wire yeah it's uh it's not a Which, not an ideal situation that's and that, that to me makes it even more surprising to me that the Tyrell Crosby didn't get claimed, but I guess I wonder, maybe there's some baggage there. Yeah. There's some, again, something, maybe people were scared of the injury. Um, yeah. You know, I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll see. All right. Uh, that puts a bow on offense uh, shifting to defense. I think things are a little bit more clear on the defensive line. Uh, Michael Brockers and Nick Williams are your starters at your defensive line, like, you know, your three technique, four eye technique guys. Uh, Lee McNeil is going to be your starter at the nose. Uh, Onzerike is going to be one of the top reserves that plays all over the place. Uh, Penasini is your backup nose. And uh, Deshaun Hand makes the team and then promptly goes on IR, as we kind of most, as we kind of all expected. And then, um, Kevin Strong makes the roster and essentially takes Deshaun Hand's spot um, in the rotation. So seven guys make it, six guys are there now. And then Bruce Hector is uh, becomes your eighth defensive lineman, seventh one that's you know able to practice, but he's on the practice squad. And um, uh, geez, tough decisions kind of played out how we thought though, right? Yeah. I mean, I don't think anything was we kind of all saw the hand thing coming. And so we all said, yeah, if they're going to lose hand, they got to keep strong. Um, another player that earned his spot. I mean, look, he's earned his spot three years in a row now. Yes, you yeah. know what I mean? Like, uh, so uh, 
good for Kevin. Uh, look, I, you go on Kevin's Wikipedia page and I am a reference for like half of the articles. <laughs> honestly, <laughs> honestly, if, <laughs> it's because I write, I, I write way more about Kevin Strong than I think than anybody else. Uh, I like him quite a bit. And uh, I was happy for him that he was able to, uh, to make the roster again. Uh, but my goodness, he added some power to his game. Yeah. And that first step is still quick. And so that quickness and power together, he's getting more comfortable. He's looking more seasoned. He's looking like a guy who can stick. Oh, I totally forgot. Uh, Jay Sean Cornell suspended for three games. Yeah. So there's another guy, that, yeah. right? Yep. So um, here's where I was going with this. I think Kevin Strong is playing well enough that if he continues to play this well, that in three weeks when Hand is eligible to come off of IR and Cornell is eligible to come off of suspension, I think Kevin might keep them in the evaluation period for a couple of more weeks. Before, you know, be, and they won't just like be like, okay, we got to get somebody back in the roster. We got we to gotta hurry Hand through his injury rehab and get him back there. I think Strong, has, if he keeps it up, he should he can he can keep them at bay and yeah. maybe cornell might not even come back type of thing even though they like him a ton but kevin's been playing really well he has he, he's giving off very like carrie Hyder vibes and that like okay not not necessarily in the way he plays but in the way he just he sticks around like he's just yeah. he's a guy that you continually count out and he's like no i'm here like i i'm going to be taking a role on this team and yeah i think I think things are going to get very interesting in three weeks when they have, they don't have to make a decision. Like you said, on, on Deshaun, yeah. right away. they can hold him for however long they want, but what do you do with Deshaun Cornell? Like, I don't, I, you can't keep him on the suspended list after three weeks. Correct. No Cornell. You're going to have to make a decision on by the end of week four, like you'll the Saturday before the game, they'll have to have a decision the yeah. before game four with hand. There's going to be a 21 day evaluation period. And so then that's once they want to evaluate him, they can actually keep him on IR as long as they want. Right. Then they can start a 21 day activation period and then they can decide after that. So um, they can figure they, they're going to have some time with hand if he's not ready. Uh, but Cornell, the decision on Cornell is going to come down quicker. Um, could be Penasini that's looking over his shoulder sure. If, sure. Uh, if, if Kevin keeps playing well, but you know, they really like Cornell. I mean, they really like him a lot. They put they him do. in a lot of well. high. Yeah. I don't know if he played as well as the other is he has, I don't think he has as much upside as the right. other two, in my opinion. Uh, that's kind of, I don't know. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm hey. just uh, worrying about him a little bit. Can I ask you about Deshaun hand? Because I know there are a yeah, lot yeah. of fans out here thought this, like you just got to give up on the guy. You just sure. got to cut him at this point. And yeah. I know you, you've long stand for Deshaun hand. So yeah. I'm not asking you to, to slam the guy <laughs> or anything, but are, are you surprised at all that maybe like considering how crowded this room was that they weren't just like, we, we like your game, but we can't <clears throat> trust you at this point. Well, I, no, I, I, I'm not surprised they kept him. Um, I, I, I think the talent is just a little bit better than everyone else that can do the things that he does. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Um, but again, if it's not far off and he's coming back and then he gets injured again, I could see them saying, okay, yeah. that's it. I think the situation they were in right now where they could add him, IR him, make a decision later was right. an easy decision just to make, yeah. just to keep just him for that. Yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, but when it starts getting into the time when he has to come back, and if he does come back and then he gets injured again, and then they may not want to play roster gymnastics with him right. then. Right now, it's easy. Right now, it's a simple you know, move. Uh, maybe later, though, they do get tired of that. Um, D-line, like I said, kind of what we expected. Uh, Andre Fluellen, I mean Bruce Hector, is uh, <laughs> hanging around uh, as well. He just doesn't seem like he's going to go away. Um, right. I mean, he's DL nine on this. I mean, this is such a different defensive line in terms of <laughs> they, depth. And they kept Miles Brown originally too as, as yeah. nose tackle three, but he eventually also got cut from the practice. Floor. I actually liked. Uh, I thought he played well down the he stretch. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if he snatches. You know, somebody else snatches him up a little bit. You know, 
couple weeks in the season or so. Um, okay, so sticking with the kind of uh, outside D, D line, I guess outside linebackers here. Um, Trey Flowers and, and Romeo Aquara are your starters. Julian Aquara is looking like uh, he could be edge three in a pass rushing uh, only role. And then both Austin Bryant and Charles Harris make the team. I had just Austin Bryant because I thought they would stick with his upside. You actually made the point that why don't you keep him and keep the guy who's playing better right now in, in Harris so you get the upside guy and the guy who's performing well, and that's what they did. They 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 must have read your article on or your uh, fifty three, <laughs> and so um, you end up with with five edge rushers, and this just adds to the defensive line because now, you know, Trey's a guy who can kick into the line when he needs to, especially like in third downs and stuff like that. And so yeah. there's going to be situations like in an NASCAR where this is like where Deshaun Hand was valuable, right? Deshaun Hand could play the nose in a NASCAR, and then you could flank him with um, with like Levi and, uh, and, and Flowers, or maybe even just Flowers, and then you also put the Aquaras on the outside of that, and you got a lot – I mean, that's just – that's quick. That's a quick, <laughs> quick, quick defensive line. So I think maybe Levi takes that role now that Hand yep. is, is out, and it makes a ton of sense considering his experience at the nose. Uh, but fly, again, Flowers is that versatile piece. You're going to see the Aquaras um, and do some damage. And uh, I think Romeo is, is set up to be have an even better season. Uh, he is a guy who got 10 sacks with a makeshift defensive line next to him. And now that defensive line is more stout. Uh, there's more edge presence. There's more interior presence, more pr interior pressure. And they're, you're not going to be able to focus on Romeo like teams were able to do uh, down the season and at the, at the end of the season. And so Romeo set up well. I mean, and look, and Romeo looks he look Romeo looks like he can drop into coverage. He looks like he can he's spying the flag. I mean, he can do he's doing a lot. And I think Romeo is uh, we're not even close to seeing his ceiling <laughs> as, as, as scary as yeah. that is. He was honestly one of the more impressive guys out there on the defensive side of the ball all camp. And, yeah. you know, you, you mentioned the 10 sack numbers and, and putting that into context of bad defensive line next to him. Um, I think also part of that context is a, a kind of soft mentality on defense or passive mentality, maybe is a better way because they're going to mm -hmm. be a lot more aggressive this year. No, no doubt about it. They're going to send a lot of guys which could free him up, or maybe he's the guy that occupies spots because as he said, said at the beginning of the offseason, like the cat's out of the bag with him. Like he's no, he's no yeah. longer a secret. So, you know, I think it's a little bit of a balance there. Like he's going to draw more attention just because of the season he had, but he, but he, he's also got a lot more talented guys around him who might draw attention away from him. So uh, I'm really excited to see what he can do this year, because I do think uh, he's, he's could take his talents to, to the next level. And like you said, I think we're just kind of scratching the surface with him a little yeah. bit. I, I don't know how you're going to double team people. I don't yeah. you know what I mean? Like on Anybody. this line, like if you double team one, you're putting other guys in a bad spot. Yep. Um, and the way that they're set up in their base to have five across and then, but oh, maybe only bring four, then you have to kind of pick and choose. And if you don't pick right, and that's kind of the, the beauty of this team, this uh, defensive front, but you know, we haven't even seen it all together yet right. either like Brockers has just been kind of like doing his thing and like yep. waiting to get ready for the season for you know until like right now and when you add Brockers into that and then you know you start mixing in you're rotating these guys because you want them to stay fresh yeah it's this is this this is where your defense is going to live and die I, I in my yeah, opinion I agree and you got to hope because when you shift back to the uh interior uh some linebackers those guys, it, it's a little bit more questionable. I think Collins and Anzalone are the starters, which we kind of expected. Uh, and then after that, everybody else that was competing for uh, OL, OL, or no, LB3, um, Sean Dillon Hamilton, he's on IR. Then it was uh, Tavai, who's now a, a, a Patriots practice squad guy. They're gone. And so now it sure looks like Derek Barnes is yeah. your linebacker three. And it's a little bit nerve wracking because he's, he's still relatively new to the position, but dear Lord, <laughs> that, that guy, he can, he has shown that. I think he, I think he think he's ready. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and, and I'm jump putting the cart in front of the horse here, but um, because we haven't really seen him make mistakes, but 
some of that is because we've only seen him play what 50 snaps right, right? so right. you know maybe that's part of it and he's going to make mistakes we just we haven't seen him yet and right. what we have seen is five pressures sack uh a couple two pass breakups a near interception blew uh, up a screenplay gosh mike i mean like the <laughs> the speed no nope. no one has been has. more fun to watch on this team than yeah. him in the preseason right like yeah, literally no other player yeah i well i mean as a for us you know defensive junkies that's for sure yeah um yeah so you're hoping he's ready and this is if he continues his his uh you know ascent it could be a guy who starts taking spots away from uh, Anzalone down the road now it's real I mean, it's, it's really interesting how this whole dynamic is going to work because <sighs> Anzalone's probably going to have the green dot because yeah. he's familiar with the th- with the scheme and so he's going to be translating plays uh i don't think he's a 100 percent of snap player though and right. if he is he's shown he he's not always the most you know healthy person he can get injured uh and so then that becomes a little bit concerning now jamie collins should be able to adapt that green dot uh in the preseason they when anzalone was not there they were giving it to reeves maybin I don't, I mean, I don't think Barnes is ready for it either. I, I think it would, the green dot would have to go to Jamie Collins. Um, yeah. And it's interesting how they've been utilizing these guys too, because Collins has been more of the mic, the traditional green dot role, uh, the green dot, just in case we're talking over people said that's the, 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 the helmet that has the, sp- the, uh, the, the micro, mm-hmm. the, uh, the ear piece, right. Essentially. So you yeah. can hear the play call from the coaches. Um, Collins has been playing the mic and then he's been shifting depending on the play, right. Uh, with the, with Anzalone and they've kind of swapped roles depending on what they're looking for. They've dropped primarily are dropping Anzalone into coverage, but Collins can do that as well. So they'll drop him sometimes. They're also going to blitz him a bunch. Yeah. Uh, and that's where he really gets fun. Yeah. And then um, essentially Barnes is, a junior varsity version of uh of um collins right now right. uh who has the potential to be better than collins you know down the road right and so how much can you put a cap on that and and can you have collins and barnes on the field at the same time and just turn them both loose uh <laughs> that would be fun yeah um so it's an interesting dynamic um when you get past barnes you get the reeves maben who had one really good quarter of football. Yep. And uh, that's about it. against Pittsburgh. And then the second quarter against Pittsburgh happened. Yeah. Um, so I'm a little bit concerned about his ability to get on the field. Uh, and then Pippen, I mean, look, Pittman might get on the field before him, honestly, yeah. because Pittman has looked uh, better and more natural in his, uh, in his role. Now, look, uh, for those who haven't, you know, aren't familiar with the, the Pittman journey, Pittman plays at Wayne State. He's 225 pounds. Um, comes from Birmingham Groves, local local high school, right? So, um, 225 Mike at Wayne State comes to the Lions. They ask him to put on weight. They shift him to Jack, and he he goes all the way up to like 250 something, almost 260, uh, which is insane. Yeah, and he he's getting some run there, and he gets a run his rookie at the end of his rookie season, week seventeen. He played some Jack. Uh, then the following year, he doesn't really um, he he doesn't get onto the field at all. I don't believe. Uh, now he comes back uh, into the with this new regime. They shift him back to the mic. He drops back down to like two thirty. Like these linebackers all had dropped so much weight. It was just terrible. <laughs> I don't like why, why, why is Patricia grabbing a guy who's two twenty five in the first place? I, I don't know. I, I <laughs> honestly, like, I don't think it was him. I think like they, yeah. I think the scouts, the Lions scouts were like, this is a guy who can play. And <laughs> then they looked at him and they went and put some weight on, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you know, ugh, geez. Um, but he's he's athletic. He's instinctive. Yeah. He made a lot of plays in the preseason, uh, not in the preseason, but in practice. Right. He looked real good in practice, much yeah. better. Um, and he's a guy who I, I wouldn't be surprised if he got some run ahead of a guy like Reeves Maven, even though I know there's a ton of Reeves Maven fans out there. Uh, Pittman, don't sleep on him. Uh, but again, young, very young. 
in the, in the linebacker depth. And um, both Anzalone and Collins have not proven to be always the most healthy players. And so we may get that young dose of linebacker earlier than we, that we were anticipating. So youth is a pretty good transition to the next position. If you want to go into cornerbacks. Yeah. Like, yeah. You want to talk about youth. I mean, <laughs> gee, so Pete's they're like, if you, if your birth certificate does not say, uh, when 1998, you're cut. <laughs> Basically. <laughs> right? Yeah. If you were born before 1998, you can't play for us. <laughs> um, because oh gosh, man, like, so Akuda and, and, uh, and uh, Owari, those are your starters. They have been all camp. They're going to be uh, no surprises. Mike Ford, who was set in line to be outside corner three, we all thought, uh, was really falling out of favor. And uh, he was released. He's now a Denver Bronco, which means uh, third round pick Ifedi uh, Melifanwu is now your Outside corner three, maybe even he, you're going to see him in the, in the slot as well because he was doing some situational work in the slot, which I, I find very intriguing. And then just to keep things rolling, you got another rookie, an undrafted one in A.J. Parker, who's your rookie inside. So you've got a third year, a second year, and two rookies in, in very <laughs> prime roles. Yeah. And then if that's not enough, your backups are another undrafted rookie in Jerry <laughs> Jacobs and a converted uh, safety in Bobby Price, who was an undrafted rookie last year. Last year. So, uh, okay. Now this is all, this is all fun, but look, Nicole Roby Coleman is on the practice squad. Yep. And he's probably going to be a week one elevation to, and he's going to help that give them more depth in the secondary and then he'll probably be signed to the active roster in week two when contracts don't become guaranteed. Yep. So you're maybe, I mean, I don't, maybe that, that, <laughs> right? that's, I see it happen, playing yeah. out as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so then it becomes, okay, you're, you're going to have to lose a guy. Do you lose a guy from the secondary? Do you lose like, is this where Tom Kennedy uh, finds the ax? You know what I mean? Like who knows? Um, but Nicole Roby Coleman is probably a guy who's going to come in and give them depth. He'll do some dime work, uh, maybe some special teams. I don't think he's going to jump AJ Parker. At least if he does, it'd be a bit surprising because Parker has really just been, he's just like someone lit him on fire. Yeah. And so um, honestly, like it, it's crazy. Like you look around the league at some of these nickels and you're like, look at the Rams. Oh, they got a, they, they had an undrafted rookie earn their, nickel job and three years later he's still their nickel and now he he's a restricted free agent they're just you know he's a guy who's been doing like this is how it happens you're like eh, no big deal and all of a sudden you're like holy cow who is yeah. this kid because like he's just always around the ball and yeah. like he makes plays on the ball it, he just it's crazy i went back and i read uh dame brugler's uh, a draft evaluation on him mm -hmm. and it was basically like um he's got the mindset for it but does he have the athleticism i don't know if he does and then he, he compared him to uh uh benny oh god um this uh ben work or whatever his name is the guy okay. who played for like you know what i'm talking about? i'm playing i, I so. messed that name up totally but he's been like a nickel corner who's bounced around. He's been in the league for like, you know, like five or six years. Just like, you're like, oh, he's just an afterthought. And all of a sudden he's like, oh, look, he's a starting corner. And like, it's, he's just, it's an interesting, it was an interesting comparison. And, and it makes a lot of sense because this is a guy who could, who basically had the intelligence to do it. And he, he, he sh the light bulb went on. Yeah. Right. And uh, maybe that's Aubrey Pleasant or uh, Aaron Glenn influence, but whatever. The light bulb is on now. And so, He's going to, he's going to be, I, I would be shocked if uh, Roby Coleman beat him out at, at, at this point. Uh, maybe they split, who knows? And, you know, right. and I think Melifon was going to get some run in certain matchups, but sure looks like it's AJ Parker's job right now. Yeah. I think, I think the most interesting part about this cornerback room is just like your faith in them goes as far as your faith in Aubrey Pleasant, right? Because they're all super young. We've seen, I mean, 
not the fans haven't seen it as much as you and I have, but yeah. we've seen Ifatu grow already this offseason. Crazy, we've seen yeah. AJ Parker grow, even yeah. Jerry Jacobs, Jeff Okuda. Like all these guys look a lot better than they did last year. Yeah. But at the same time, we haven't seen it translate on the field yet. Sure. And so there, there is a certain amount of faith that you just kind of have to have yeah. that the, the process will work out. But it's, it's an exciting, but also kind of terrifying group of players. <laughs> yeah. And it's, Yes. And a lot of their success is going to be a product of what happens with the, the defensive front too. Sure. You know what I mean? Sure. Hopefully yeah. that defensive front makes their jobs easier as well. So a um, little, so a little bit of shakeup. Um, like I said, losing Mike Ford was a surprise to everyone. Um, Bobby Price and Jacobs are probably your starting gunners. If I had to guess. Yeah, that, and, and that's what I'm going to put on my depth chart when I put it out. I don't think maybe Melifanu sneaks in, maybe Kadero Hodge sneaks in. I think, but my I think guess Cephas has a small chance too. I'm just going to throw that out there. <clears throat> yeah, uh, but the reps though, the reps were Price, Jacobs, Melifanu, and Ford, and with no Ford. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and and Jerry Jacobs did say that he was I a will. starting special teamer. Right. So, yeah. That makes me think he's probably got yeah. the the gunner thing. And look, we've talked we talked about this uh, previously as well. Like he has shown he can produce as a gunner as long as he's not squaring his head up as keeping as long as he keeps his head up, right. then he'll be all right. Um, so Jacobs uh, is the uh, Cinderella story of this of this class, and uh, it's got to make you know. Um, uh, Akuda and Owarie, who are big fans of his, uh, very happy. Yep. All right. Now to the safeties. Uh, Tracy Walker might, and um, Will Harris are your starters. Dean Marlowe is your safety three, and he's going to get on the field when they go to three wide safeties. And then CJ Moore is your last guy. Now, CJ Moore is a dynamic special teams player, and we all knew he was going to make the team because of that. Uh, can he be a contributor? If one of the other guys get injured, yeah, probably as like a safety three. But again, there's there's a learning curve that he still needs to um, catch up on. Um, moving Bobby Price out of this group, I mean, maybe, you know, Bobby still has the, that range where he could shift back if he needed to, but they sure seem content on keeping him on the outside at corner. Uh, but safety is, you know, still mildly concerning. It, nothing has changed. They, the, look, one of Brad Holmes' specialties is identifying and picking safeties. Yeah. He's done it multiple times, right? And they had no concerns over Will Harris, apparently, on, uh, to our outside vision, right? Yeah. They didn't even try, they didn't try and sign anybody but Marlowe. They didn't try and draft any, or they didn't, it wasn't obvious that they were trying to draft someone. Um, they even talked about how it was an extremely deep safety class and yeah. still didn't draft anyone. Right. And they seem very content with Will Harris to the dismay of everybody. Almost. <laughs> yeah. Right? Uh, it's, it's crazy because he's had that starting job all camp. Dean Marlowe yeah. was never really no. in contention for that spot. Never. And, and who's the guy that they said had one of the best camps? Him. Will Harris. And here's the crazy thing. And again, we, I mean, I'm going to expose a little bit more than what we did earlier in the off season, but when there were times when we noticed that people were like uh, going over to the video board and talking about, Hey, this is what happened on this play. It more than once, it was Will Harris who made the mistake. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and so like, that's all I kept seeing was, okay. Yeah. He's showing more range. He's getting, he's getting pass breakups. He's getting interceptions, like, and which he was, he was he, sure. his, his, yeah. his ability to come off his coverage or off his zone and, 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 and range over showed his athletic. And he was, I mean, there's he's doing some things he never even showed hints of right. uh, before. And, but he was still making mistakes. And the fact that he was still making these mistakes and they were still like, yeah, well, Eric was, Lou Harris was like, he had the best camp of everybody. And I was like, wow. Like, yeah, that's so surprising to me because I still saw him making mistakes and they just, they're enamored with him. They think he's going to be good. So, and I mean, I, listen, I, he's looked better. 
I, and I think he's yes. gotten better. I think yes. I think if you want to talk maybe most improved in camp, maybe he's in that conversation. Sure, I'll go with that. But best, I don't. The, I mean, but not best. And yeah. also, I, I'm I'm I, I wrote in our mailbag this week. I'm scared about both these guys because yeah. we saw we saw Ben Roethlisberger tear him apart, and it was largely yeah. the safeties that were at fault. Like obviously linebackers were really bad in that game too. And Okuda gives up the big yeah. play, but Will Harris wasn't there over the top when he probably should have been. It was a tough assignment for him, but listen, on I, the, I just, on the Okuda I, play, right? Yeah. On the Okuda yeah. play. Yeah. Cause there was what three, four verts on that play and he was the single high. So, you know, kind of pick, pick your poison there, but yeah, yeah the I just, side. Yeah. yeah, it's, it's a group that has a lot to prove me. They, they've they've apparently proven themselves to the coaching staff, and they're playing with a lot more confidence, which I think you can pretty much say about anyone across the board yeah. that was in this t- defense last year. Um, but, yeah, I, I don't have the confidence in this group that, that the coaching staff certainly does. And safety is a massive role in this sure. scheme because safeties make the adjustment calls to the coverages. And that's, that's Tracy's job. And yeah. Tracy has – owned that and that's why Tracy lived at that video board and why he was constantly seeking out Pleasant and Glenn uh and I again the defensive backs will benefit from a the pressure up front and we really haven't seen what this what this front can do uh I mean we it's flashed some stuff but collectively as a group they should help the safeties out even more um but yeah the you got to have some strong play from the linebackers too. You got to be strong on the interior uh, line on the, at the linebacker level. And then that, then the safeties can, can do their jobs as well. But if the other two, if one of the other two groups doesn't do their job and they put the safeties in a bad spot, I don't know if the safeties can overcome that right now. I think if yeah. the, if the linebackers and the defensive line do their job, then the safeties can do that. will do their job and, and they'll be all right. But I think if you put if you stress them a little bit, that's when things get a little bit, you know, concerning. Agreed. All right. Uh, special teams. John Wickar is one of the <laughs> smartest people we know, right? <laughs> uh, we were so. Uh, I don't know if you talked about this on the POD podcast, but um, we are sitting around the was it day before cuts it was saturday afternoon or saturday yeah. afternoon evening right before some some cuts started coming in yeah uh yeah so the initial yeah the initial few cuts came in and john sends us a message and says hey i've got this idea i'm i want to talk to you guys about and uh and he says I, what if they don't keep both kickers and that frees up a roster spot for them to do something else and you are like, yep, I like it. Let's uh, write it up and we'll, we'll go with it. You know, you, you're like, Eric, what are the you know pitfalls? And I'm like, I right, well, you know, X, Y, or Z, right? Um, but since nobody was in love with the kickers, it seemed like a good idea. And, right. and so we're like, yeah, John, go ahead. You know, write it up. I'm right. And John writes a very nice piece. Uh, it makes sense. Everything's logically laid out. And um, we put it out there. Like you published it that night uh and so it was out out there for everyone to read including brad holmes and um (laughs) and then the next day uh that's what happens they cut both kickers and john looks like the smartest guy in detroit uh well he's in canada but still uh he looks like the (laughs) smartest guy in the room right and uh kudos to john for for coming up with that and uh recognizing that as an opportunity and um and it happens. So they, they cut the kickers. They don't care that they, they don't think are doing a whole lot. Um, they end up bringing Zane Gonzalez back on the practice squad. Uh, but they claim uh, off of waivers, uh, Austin Siebert. And so Siebert becomes now their kicker. Now, I don't know. I, I don't know how in love I am with Sie- for, uh, Siebert. Um, can't even get his name right. That's how I'm not in love with I am. I am right. Um, we'll see. Uh, uh, well, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen to kicker. I really don't. <laughs> yeah, no, I really I mean, don't. I know Jack Fox is going to be an, an absolute animal. And yeah. I know Scott Daly will be the, the new Santa Claus, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and uh, now we uh, and we'll see what happens with Siebert. I, I don't have strong inclinations, positive or negative. I just don't know what to expect. 
Yeah, I think I think the one thing we can expect, and it was really true of all every single kicker that went through this camp, is you, you're not going to get the power that you had with Matt Prater. You're just you're not going right. to have these gimme 52, 56, 58 yarders that Matt Prater was making because what Austin Siebert's longest in college was 51, and I don't think he's eclipsed that at, at the professional level either. So maybe you know 52 or 53. Nothing nothing longer than that he's only what one for two I think from beyond 50 in his NFL career. So. I, I looked at his numbers when they when they claimed them, and I have not cared to look back. Right, so I, it's, it's yeah. a very shrug your shoulders move, yeah. which is why which is why they cut both kickers, right? Like they were right. they were like even when we proposed the idea at Pride of Detroit, it was more like let's just create a temporary roster room and then bring one of them back. Yeah, because neither of these guys are going to get claimed, or you know, and yeah. I think I were. think John I think John did say or get something better. So right. Um, right. Yeah, we'll see if they actually ended up getting someone better. But like, I think yeah. I think the move made sense at the time just to create one of those temporary roster spots, which is what they did. Yeah. And then they go out and claim a guy. And, and, I, and the I, right guy. I was kind of preferring the Ravens guy, because if you lose to Justin Tucker, well, guess what? That makes you every single other human being <laughs> in the world, because every everyone would lose a, a camp competition right. to Justin Tucker. But right. Um, yeah, this is a shrug your shoulders move. Yeah. And, and I'm not surprised Gonzalez. Uh, comes back. I actually had him on my practice squad prediction in my final 53 because I expected them to not be satisfied with the kicking competition and they don't seem to be totally comfortable. I think Campbell called it a competition. They said yeah. the kicking competition is still competition. not over. Yep. Uh, and so I don't know. I don't know if you can start like flopping these guys around and stuff like that. Like at the last minute, like if you're like, Hey, Gonzalez had a better camp, you know, we're going to cut and sign and maybe they will. Uh, but, or, you know, maybe they elevate and then um, make one inactive or I don't know. But I mean, to, I don't, I don't think maybe they, maybe they went into the situation thinking we didn't give Zane Gonzalez a fair enough, enough. shot to yeah. win the job because yeah. I, I'm sure they That's wanted true. more out of him in, in the preseason game. And they just, they didn't ever find themselves in the position to kick even a 40 yard field goal when he was on the team. So <laughs> maybe they're just like, let's extend his tryout another couple of weeks and see what happens. Yeah. Makes sense. Uh, least exciting roster battle that we have <laughs> it just is uh and i like special teams but my goodness all right um what is uh that's it um, we made it yeah we got you know a few we talked about all the irs and all that jazz blah 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 so all right perfect all right um any I mean, I think we covered most of it. I don't know if you have any closing thoughts that you want to add. Um, I think I've, I said the majority of what I want to say. Yeah, no, I think, I I mean, just like the overall takeaways are that this team is incredibly young and those young players are going to get playing time right away, which is something we've heard the coaches say consistently through camp, right? Like if you're Mm -hmm. young, we're not going to wait. Like if you, if you have the talent, we want you out there because that, I mean, that's the best way you learn. And we, we talked about it with Penny Sewell all the time with, with his early struggles. Like the, the only way those things are going to get better with reps. And right. so this team ideally is going to look a lot different in December than it does right now. And if, if it does, then I think we can feel good about this, uh, the direction of this team. I, uh, I'm with you. I'm with you. I think, uh, so for the listeners, I, I think we're going to try and get, I, I'm going to try and get back on the same schedule with Joe if I can this week. If I can't, I'm going to find another way to preview the 49ers. Uh, we're going to have another podcast before week one. Uh, I think we've bumped up our ratings in another couple again. We're up to 389, I think, in uh, total reviews. So we're not, we're not at quite at, uh, at, POD's uh, 525 or whatever it is. That, hey, that, that you're, you're counting, not me. You're counting. Uh, well, you know what I'm counting? I'm counting the stars, and I got 4.9 of them. Oh, God. Uh, wow. <laughs> wow. I'm your guest, sir. <laughs> uh, no, like I said, you have 525 reviews. That's terrific. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I remember I was like with uh, – our podcast was within like uh, – I don't know, like 30 at one point. And then all of a sudden you guys have taken off. Apparently you got a new uh, guest over there that does some uh, nice stuff for you. Does some, yeah. Like. There's a guy who does some Q and A's with us. <laughs> Sorry. Well, thank you for uh, jumping in today, buddy. And uh, making it, you know, so that it's not just me talking to the mic and boring people. So uh, <laughs> I appreciate it. And, um, how, but that's how you get your four, 4.9 stars. 
I guess. I mean, most <laughs> honestly, let's be real. Not, Joe, Joe just keeps me on track. Uh, he just true. lets me ramble. I, I could, uh, but Joe does a nice job of facilitating me 100%. and keeping me uh, on track. And, and I, I can be one to often just, you know, just wander away. And, uh, and, and Joe's the, the glue that makes, makes the podcast 100%. function. <laughs> so, uh, so yes, it's probably good that I didn't do this by myself. Um, so again, thank you so much. Uh, and then we will uh, we'll be back for 49ers preview before the weekend's game. And until next time, let's go Lions.